out. Everybody. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Lights Out. I'm your host, Josh. I'm joined in the studio by the boys, my co-host, Austin. What a man. Looking for God. That's what I had to. Nice. That's Me a too. Theo Vaughn quote, actually. Oh. <laughs> he always says that. Or he says, looking for the Lord. Looking when for the Lord. When people are like, hey, what's up, Theo? He's like, looking for, just looking for the Lord. <laughs> nice. I like that. That's great. And then our producer, Daniel. How's it going, man? It's going good. How, How are you feeling doing? today? Dude, I feel way better than I did a couple weeks ago. That was Amazing. Awful. Yeah. You bounced back. Oh, I bounced back. All the colors return to your face. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Well, today we are uh, diving back into the world of real life horror stories for you and this one in particular is pretty nutty there's a lot of crazy freak accidents and stories of people's vacations that ended in just absolute nightmares and it's kind of ironic that we're covering this episode because next week we're actually me taking a week off from the show because i'm going on vacation uh without my daughter for the first time which i'm very torn about because all of our previous trips have been with her and this is the first time i think we've left her for a whole week yeah uh which will be tough but i think the only other time you kind of left her back was the camp out yeah yeah just a couple two nights or something has been the longest so uh yeah and i'm going to the beach too and of course our first story we're going to dive into is a very very crazy freak accident that happens at the beach and could happen to really anybody and so yeah this is gonna be in the back of my mind uh while i'm at the beach next week yeah and what follows is even crazier yeah right yeah yeah it only gets uh, crazier maybe it's good holly staying home honestly safety of your home (laughs) god yeah these these stories are absolutely insane and horrifying and happened fairly recently some of these so uh yeah buckle up for this one But uh, yeah, shall we just dive into our our first one here? Let's do it. So we're going to start off by talking about a vacation disaster that happened in Tulum, Mexico, a beautiful place many of us have gone to. Have you been to Tulum? No, it's I've actually never been to Mexico, but this is one of the places I wanted to go to. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful spot. I was there a few years ago and... Yeah, it's it's a stunning destination and yeah, it's it's just you know, I think it's anytime you go on vacation, danger is like farthest like the farthest thing from your mind, I feel like. And so sometimes things just happen and that's that's what happened with this first story here. So so a man named Jared Hill uh from Texas was down in Tulum, Mexico with his boyfriend Justin Rayford and they had been together for about 3 years. And so they decided to take a trip down to Tulum, Mexico in February. Justin was a well-prepared traveler. He always tried to be on top of international health insurance and was aware of the closest hospital, which I think is probably a little bit more than most of us do when we leave the country. I didn't even think of this stuff before I read this story. Yeah, I think it's good to be informed when traveling abroad, at least kind of know where things are. And it's kind of that Boy Scout. I mean, you're a boy scout yeah be prepared, always be prepared right? yeah. i think the thing is i don't really travel internationally so normally when i'm <laughs> nor <laughs> for the listeners uh daniel's saluting me with the boy <laughs> scout thing. um but normally i was so i'm actually going on like my first actual inter international trip you are later this year i'll be going to italy so i, I think i'll have more preparedness than I normally do because normally I'm just like when I vacation, I'm inside the U S where my healthcare is accepted. I do generally know the areas I'm going to. So I've never really had to do too much research, but I should. Yeah. It's probably a good thing that we all, I mean, that's hopefully one thing you can take away from these stories is, I mean, even though it doesn't really help in this particular one, but just try to think through the what ifs Yeah, and you know, have a contact that you can reach out to emergency contact that can help you in case something happens. Well, Justin had previously been to Tulum on vacation, so he was pretty familiar with the area. But in early February, Justin and Jared headed to the beach where they jumped around and had fun in the ocean waves. And after a while, Justin got tired. So he headed back to the cabana to relax. They're just down at the the beach club, having a good day. It's beautiful outside. Water's blue. 
and uh, we're going to show you a clip of Justin talking about what happened next. I was tired and was like, I want to go lay back in the cabana. And I actually started to walk away. I, I heard a voice like inside of me say, like, you need to like watch him. And I turned around and saw a bigger wave come and get him and, and it crashed him into the bottom of the ocean. And then I saw him not come up and I was like, oh my gosh, what's going on? And he was under the water because he was fully paralyzed and I had to pull him up. And he was just screaming, I can't move my body, I can't move my body. And I had to pick him up and carry him back to the beach while I was screaming for help. It's crazy that this is something that is probably, if you've ever been to the beach or the ocean, there's no doubt probably been a time that you've been tossed around by a wave. Yeah. I know I have several times and it's always a very scary moment and it's not necessarily because I'm worried about shattering my neck, but just drowning or, yeah. you know, sometimes there's rocks on the bottom, but this is something that could happen to anybody yep. at Absolutely. any point on any beach in the world. And so Jared is, ah. Uh, I, I just like seeing this play out of my head and Jared's screaming for help. He's in absolute agony, completely immobilized by this wave that just slammed him into the bottom of the ocean. And I mean, I think sometimes you underestimate just how powerful those waves are. Yeah. Rogue wave. And no matter how big you are too, it'll just pick you up and toss you around like a rag doll. And you know, what's crazy is that, you know, Jared's, you know, carried up to the, the beach. He's laying on the beach. And Justin notices a bunch of staff members starting to gather around. And the manager actually ordered the staff members to circle around Jared so that other tourists on the beach couldn't see what was happening. Which is just mind-blowing to me that they're trying to keep other patrons, which is like, how though? Because he's screaming. So like, what's the point of trying to surround, surround him and keep people from seeing what's going on? But after about 40 minutes, Justin felt that something wasn't right because he had asked one of the staff members blocking Jared if they could call for an ambulance, of course. And the staff member started pulling out their phone, but the manager interrupted and said no. The staff member then immediately put his phone away. And by now, Justin knew something was seriously wrong. So he ran over to the cabana to get his phone. He used WhatsApp to message the hotel's concierge to tell them what was happening. And he said that Jared was in serious trouble and they needed an ambulance immediately even though the staff said they would call an ambulance it was pretty clear by now that one was never called they just never never called for an ambulance which is insane the concierge then contacted the general manager and confirmed with justin that no one had called for help so it's like what that's so scary to think that these staff members and manager of this beach club that they're at aren't that concerned with with his health at the moment and the fact that somebody could this guy could literally die yeah. on their beach and the biggest question is why right at yeah. this point you're like what is going on why wouldn't they call an ambulance what would be the point of that i don't know that's what still baffles me too is like it would be better to get them help right away because it shows that you guys actually care right and like what you want a death on your beach at your beach club. Like right. it just makes no sense. I'm it like, really doesn't. Maybe they're just kind of like in shock and don't know what to do, but it's just like common sense. You call for an ambulance. I don't know. It's still kind of a mystery. Yeah. Worst case scenario. My theory is that they're maybe in some money scheme cahoots with somebody Could be. with a private hospital or something like that, but I'm not sure. Yeah. That's a good point. So the concierge, you know, he sends that message through WhatsApp to um, Justin and says, hey, an ambulance was never called. He then deletes that WhatsApp message, which is also very sketchy. So imagine your, your loved one is screaming for help, potentially dying in front of you. They've just broken their neck and no help is coming. All this time is passing by and just the desperation. And you can, you can hear it in his voice as he's retelling this story just how fucking scary this would be. So Justin then calls Red Cross, hoping they can come for help. 
And at this point, several hours had passed. I believe it was like three hours that poor Jared is lying on the beach in absolute pain, screaming, just, oh, just came and imagine. And what's crazy is that the closest hospital was only four and a half miles away. And it would have only taken a few minutes for an ambulance to get Jared over there had one come initially. So an ambulance finally comes and picks up Jared. They make it over to the hospital finally. And that's when a doctor comes out and tells Justin that they would only admit Jared into the hospital if he paid them $5,000 up front, which that's, that's tough too. Like, what are you going to do in that situation? Right. You know, you're just going to pay the money. And that's exactly what Justin did because he figured he had no choice and obviously he doesn't want Jared to die. After paying the money, they finally got Jared admitted and he had a CT scan. And as it turned out, his neck was completely shattered. His C1 vertebra along with C5, C6, and C7 were broken. His spinal cord was also bent into the shape of an S. And some pieces of his shattered vertebra were sticking into his spinal cord. Can even imagine how horrible the pain must have been imagine like these doctors are leveraging this guy's life for money for money yeah which is insane to think about so i mean yes in the grand scheme of things that's what hospitals do but not like this because like in the u.s you get admitted in a most a lot of hospitals you'll just get admitted and you'll get the care and then they'll give you the bill later and you have to figure that out but yet yeah, hospitals in the U.S. don't operate like this. It's not like money up front or he doesn't get admitted. No, right. They're just going to save your life here in the U.S., which is terrifying. That's how it operates at this, which I believe this is a private hospital in Mexico. Right. Uh, yeah, it's an important thing to know. But let's listen to Justin tell us what happened next. His C567 and his spinal cord was bent in like an S. And there was pieces of his vertebrae sticking into his spinal cord. And they were just like, this is really bad. Like, we can't help you. The pair went to another hospital. The bumpiest ambulance ride with a broken neck for it took over an hour and a half to get there. They do an MRI on him that took two hours. And, you know, I'm just pacing back and forth. So a neurosurgeon on staff at the second hospital told Justin that Jared needed surgery and doctors didn't do anything for the next 24 hours. Meanwhile, Justin's running all over the hospital, just desperately looking for help. He went to the admissions department, to the billings department. He then desperately flags down a, a nurse to get Jared more pain medication. And really any time he tried to get information from any of the staff about what was going on with his boyfriend, no one had any answers, and they kept delaying his surgery that the neurosurgeon said he needed, but for whatever reason, the staff just co kept coming up with excuses. Here's Justin talking about confronting hospital staff. They had pushed off the surgery over and over again and made up all these excuses. Like, what can I do? I said, you have everything you're supposed to have, and the neurosurgeon said he could die if we don't do this surgery. And he literally looked at me and he's like, I'm so sorry. There's nothing I can do. And I said, what do you mean? And he picked up his phone and showed me a message from the hospital director saying, I'm going to keep canceling the surgery, get money out of them. They literally just wanted cash to grease the wheel to have the surgery. And this is at a hospital where people are supposed to care about people's well-being in life. Oh, I can't even imagine what that, what that would have been like. No. And yeah, like I said before, you're just leveraging someone's life for money up front, which is wild. And it's just evil, honestly. It really is. A bit later, a media national security contributor to a publication, Tracy Walder, said that this practice is supposedly not uncommon in Mexico. She said, quote, this isn't extortion. This isn't bribery. This is how Mexico does business. Mexico's national healthcare system provides free medical care for its citizens and residents in government-run hospitals, but she explained that, quote, 
There are private hospitals, and the way they do business is they do ask for payment up front. She also advised that you should never expect another country's health system to run the same as in the U.S., and people can use the SOS app, which lets users directly contact emergency services wherever they are. I did not know about this app before. Yeah, that's good to know. This. Yeah, so everyone who's going to travel abroad, check out the SOS app. Even after Justin handed over the $20,000 that they were asking for, nothing happened. They still didn't take Jared in for surgery, and in desperation, Justin began begging the neurosurgeon who finally did the procedure. But man, if you think this is a nightmare already, it gets worse. After the operation, the neurosurgeon told Justin that he did the best he could, but it wasn't perfect. Not something you want to hear from your surgeon. No, especially when you're performing surgery in such a sens- sensitive area as your yeah. spinal cord, right? He said Jared was hemorrhaging blood really bad at the top of his neck, and they couldn't fix two of his vertebrae. They had performed essentially a 360 surgery on his neck. They first cut towards the front near his vocal cords so they could pull bone fragments out of his neck. Then they rolled him over on his stomach, cut open his neck and back again. Justin also claimed that some of the surgeons were not wearing gloves and did not wash their hands. What? That's crazy. How did these guys go to medical school? Right? What is this, 1850 or something? They just don't want to pay for it? Like, what's the excuse for that? I don't know. It's like, if you're not wearing gloves and not washing your hands and performing surgery, you're trying to kill your patient at that point. Yeah. That's insane. He also said they weren't even wearing safety glasses to protect themselves. It was just a total shit show. Justin had to beg the staff to not touch Jared with their bare hands. Something you should never have to do in a medical facility. So after several days in the hospital, Jared was finally flown to Houston, Texas. And compared to the Mexican hospital, the staff in Houston were fully prepared for him. Three nurses were waiting for Jared, who then did a full body assessment and cleanup. They took his vitals and started him on IV fluids. Within 10 minutes of check-in, a neurosurgeon came to check on him. They ran several tests on him until 3.30 a.m. And Justin expressed how much of a relief it was being back in the hands of medical professionals who actually cared about Jared's health. And I think, you know, for this story, we're playing a lot of the clips just because I think hearing it from uh, Justin himself just hits home so much harder than no. than us telling the, the full story. But yeah, this is a, a very uh, important moment of the story. Here's Justin explaining what happened next. And it was so wonderful to be back here and feel like you were in good hands. They see he has a spinal cord leak. He is still has two broken bones in his neck that weren't fixed. And they're like, he has to go into surgery right away. This is life. This is life threatening. Jared's condition worsened. And the next thing I know, the surgery for that day was canceled and we couldn't find out why. So the dot one of the doctors pulls me outside of the room and says, he, he has PE. He has pulmonary embolism. And they said it's blood clots in his lungs. And it was because in the Mexican hospital, they just kept him drugged so he never moved at all and nobody moved him. God. Just keeps getting worse. Not only does he find out the horrible news that he had pulmonary embolism, but the head of infectious diseases came down and said that Jared had meningitis from the unsanitary conditions in the Mexican hospital. And at this point, Jared was on the verge of death. So because they weren't wearing PPE and washing their hands, and I can only imagine if they're not doing that, I can only imagine how clean that hospital was or the instruments they use in the surgery. Yeah. So he's got a serious infection and they obviously can't do surgery because of the meningitis. Um, It's, you know, very, very risky to do that. At this point, Jared was completely immobile. He was on six different IVs at the same time, along with several medications, including a blood thinner and four different antibiotics. And doctors, again, super concerned about the meningitis. They need to wait for the antibiotics to kick in and and take care of that. So for the next several days, doctors just worked on stabilizing Jared's condition so they could finally take him in for the surgery he desperately needed. When they finally got him on the operating table and cut him open, 
they discovered that the Mexican doctors had installed the wrong sizes of titanium pieces in the wrong places along his vertebrae. So the doctors had to remove everything, basically undo the surgery that the doctors in Mexico did and put in all new hardware. They fused a C1 and C2 vertebrae and put a plate in the back of his head. They also discovered a surgical cut that they assumed was a mistake by Mexican doctors along his spinal cord, which might have explained why there was that spinal fluid leaking. Oh, Dude. God, it's just... So basically, who even knows who this neurosurgeon was or what kind of right. actual training experience he had? Dude, I have... Okay. This makes me not want to go to Mexico, and I've always wanted to go to Mexico. Yeah. It's... I hate saying that or yeah. hearing that because it's such a awesome place, but you have to be so careful. This is, this is worst case scenario, I yeah. think, in a vacation. We really started with one of the worst ones yeah, here. This is I definitely a worst case scenario. Yeah, I can't imagine anything more scary. But luckily, the American surgeons did really, really well, and it looked like Jared would survive, which is an absolute miracle considering everything that happened to him. And here's another clip of Justin talking about how he feels about his boyfriend, Jared, after everything that happened. Jared is such an amazing man. I love him so much. He's the most positive, sweet, kind person I've ever met. He stayed so positive and in control and calm, which I don't know how he did not being able to move and being told you were going to die three different times. A few weeks later, Jared recovered from his surgery, but still struggled with being paralyzed. He's taken time off from work to recover in physical and occupational therapy, and he started regaining his movement by wiggling his shoulders and arms slightly, and he eventually regained the ability to walk again, which is absolutely amazing and a testament to him, of course, and just how strong of a human being he is, because I can imagine going through this, and to hear he's just such a positive person and has just been a trooper through all of this is is incredible this is really best case scenario after all this. yeah i mean this story could have ended a million different ways but i'm glad it ended like this me too and i'm sure you out there probably think the same thing because an update from his family came out on april 1st 2024 and it said jared had a great easter weekend surrounded by friends and family and is learning to walk with less assistance as the amazing team here at tirr continues to train his muscles and nerves to reactivate he is keeping positive for this journey of many months to come. But yeah, there's a GoFundMe if you want to help support Jared's recovery. Uh, Lights Out just donated $200 to help them reach their goal. So if you want to join us in helping Jared out, we'll link that GoFundMe below and wish nothing but good luck going forward. Yeah. And good fortune because, I mean, to to survive that is is truly a miracle and just uh, I'm so happy for for Justin and Jared and that they get to you know continue their life I'm guessing they'll probably never return to Mexico though after after that ordeal which yeah couldn't blame them for that and I'm sure Mexico is not the only place with a healthcare system like that I'm sure there's other places in the world where you could run into that issue yeah, super predatory but yeah and uh you know good on Justin too for sticking by him this yeah, whole time absolutely yeah, I just thought when I ran across that story, I was like, oh my God, I had to tell everybody I, I knew about that. And I was like, we got to put this in an episode because it's just, I mean, it's such a horrible story, but it has a great, at least a positive ending to it. And I think it's also just a good warning to all of us that we need to be careful yeah. when we're out there playing in the waves because again, it's just such a freak accident that could happen to anybody and all it takes, you know, your neck and your spine are so sensitive and fragile that it only takes that one time for something to happen. But, oh, God. Man, it is a, it's a nice little rarity, a little positive rarity on Lights Out here that yeah, we get a, yeah. a happy ending, yeah. which is nice. Well, the next story, not so much. Not a happy ending, unfortunately, for this next one. Did you know that traditional bed sheets can harbor more bacteria than a toilet seat? No. I did not know that, and that is absolutely disgusting. Well, imagine all that bacteria that you're sleeping on and all the things it can do to your body, like acne, allergies, and stuffy noses. 
Well, I'm here to tell you about a company that's changing all of that. Miracle Made offers a whole line of self-cleaning antibacterial bedding, such as sheets, pillowcases, and comforters that prevent up to 99.7% of bacteria growth and require up to three times less laundry. Miracle Made's bedding uses silver-infused fabrics inspired by NASA, baby. Miracle Made sheets are thermoregulating and designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long so you get a better sleep every night. Nothing's worse than a hot bed. If you ask me, I like it ice cold. I like my sheets to feel cold and cool. Same. Nobody likes to sleep while they're sweating. No, it's the worst. Uh, <laughs> the reason these are antibacterial and prevent up to 99.7% of bacterial growth is because of the infusion of silver, which is very cool. Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands and feel as nice, if not nicer, than sheets used by some five-star hotels. And I can say, they are very, very comfortable, very soft. You look forward to getting into bed every night because of Miracle's bedding. If you want to get yourself some Miracle bedding, we got a special offer for you. Go to trymiracle.com slash lights out to try Miracle made sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo code lights out at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product that it's backed with a 30 day money back guarantee. Love it. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made and go to trymiracle.com slash lights out and use the code lights out to claim your free three piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash lights out to treat yourself. Thank you, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode. A 79-year-old Minnesota woman, her name was Gail Matson, recently went on what she called her, quote, last big trip. So a part of her bucket list vacation was driving through Kafue National Park in Zambia in early April 2024. Gail had raised two children as a single mother. She retired at 55, which is a sweet age to retire, as a mortgage company loan officer. Matson then split her time between the Twin Cities and the Phoenix area, and she golfs three to four times a week. She was really living up her retirement life there. She also loved playing bridge with her friends. I know that's a quintessential old people oh, yeah. card game. My grandma loved playing bridge, yeah. man. And she even organized the events for her 200-member bridge club. One of her friends called her, quote, flamboyant, friendly, and fabulous, and she loved wearing bright colors. Another friend said, quote, she was always up. She was always optimistic. She was always seeing the good side of everybody. Outside of her winters in the U.S., she spent much of the other three seasons traveling the world. Great. Also a great way to spend your retirement time. As for Zambia, she saw this as the culmination of all the trips she had ever gone on. She had basically traveled all over the world throughout her life, and she got ready to head to Zambia. She told her son, Blake Vetter, they would go skydiving together once she got back. Good for her. I know. That's a, I don't even want to go skydiving. That's too scary for no, me. No, no. My wife won't let me. <laughs> it definitely is on my bucket list, but is it worth the risk? I don't, I don't know. know. I, I'm just scared at the thought of the need for a backup parachute. That's really what oh, wow. me. Yeah. Like, Are you clear, scared of heights? I get, I get like kind of a vertigo thing when I get... I'm not scared of heights, but I do... I do get that like, whoa, when I'm standing at a cliff's edge. Yeah. Uh, doesn't everybody, <laughs> doesn't hope, everybody think, like look I down? I think it's a like, natural response, right? Like, oh, this is bad. Yeah. Danny, have you been skydiving? I have not, but I would love to go. I could see you sky. You could skydive for, for the two of us. We'll, yeah, yeah. we'll, we'll wait out on the bot at the ground and just live stream it on I'll a GoPro. A GoPro. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I, uh, I'm not much of an adrenaline junkie, I don't think. But unfortunately for Gail, though, this would be her last trip. Kafue is Zambia's largest and oldest national park at 74 years old. It's roughly the size of New Jersey and covers 8,650 square miles of savannas, seasonal floodplains, and lush forest. She went on a safari tour with Wilderness, a company operating in eight African countries and has been organizing safaris for more than 40 years. And they pride themselves on, quote, leading conservation and hospitality. The tour operator CEO, Keith Vincent, recently said that the company's guides are all extremely well-trained and experienced. 
Gail was among a group staying at the La Fupa camp and had ventured out for a photography tour. Gail, the five other passengers, and the tour guide became aware of a massive bull elephant charging toward the tour truck. Well, just to remind you, the elephant is the largest land mammal in the entire world, and they can stand up to 13 feet tall and weigh 14,000 pounds. They can also grow tusks up to 8 feet long. As the tour watched in horror as this bull elephant came charging at them, one of the passengers on board actually caught what happened next on their phone camera. And we have a clip we'll show you now. Dramatic video showing the moment an African safari turned deadly. A massive African bull elephant is seen in the distance running toward a vehicle full of tourists. Suddenly charging right at the group, eventually flipping over the entire thing with its tusks. Good God. I, they're so strong. I'm just like, how did they not just like floor it when yeah. they saw the elephant start coming at them? They did have a, a explanation after the fact. I mean, obviously, you know, they're trying to cover their hands. Yeah, that's what it sounds like to me. Because according to the wilderness CEO, the terrain and vegetation blocked the tour guide's route and he couldn't move the vehicle out of harm's way quick enough. But it's like, this is... I don't know. You guys do this all the time. Like, yeah. And why are you taking people so close to animals that can kill you if there's not a quick route in case of an emergency? Like, yeah. You should have an escape plan at all times. But man, the terrifying, beautiful creatures. I love elephants. They're yeah. one of my favorite animals. But man, Extremely smart creatures too. Yeah. Have uh, very good memories. But I, I don't want to. I don't want to come across one in the wild. No, and they can move quick too. Yeah. That that elephant closed the distance really fast. Well, poor Gale unfortunately sustained fatal injuries when the elephant toppled the tour truck. There are four other passengers on board were also treated for minor injuries. Gail's son Blake later said, quote, this is more than about a little old lady that got killed by an elephant. She lives an extraordinary life. An unnamed State Department spokesman said in response to the attack, quote, Millions of U.S. citizens engage in adventure travel each year, and attacks on humans by elephants in Zambia are a rare occurrence. The animals on these tours are extremely dangerous, but it's also extremely rare for them to attack the vehicles. Which, both statements are true. True, right? but, but it seems kind of, yeah, how about some responsibility being taken here for, I, I don't know, I feel like the tour guide definitely made the wrong call here yeah, in agree. some way, shape, or form, whether they were too close or they just assumed the elephant wasn't going to charge or as far enough away that it wasn't an issue but i don't know i wonder how that tour guide is feeling yeah after this. i would feel incredibly guilty so our next one it's another animal one which is sort funny, of because yeah. yeah it's like mostly humans human error here um the animal was really the animal was kind of a victim of this whole honestly thing. Yeah. it didn't deserve anything that happened and speaking of wild animals, our next story, so it's a dangerous reptile, but what is it doing thousands of feet in the sky? Well, here's the story, all right? And it's not Godzilla. <laughs> I was going to say, it's the only reptile I know of that's, that's thousands that of feet high. in the sky. Yeah. So British pilot Chris Wilson, he moved to the Democratic Republic of Congo in 2010 after giving up his job as a cabin crew member with a British airline. Because he had bigger dreams of being a commercial airline pilot, he figured, hey, might be easier for me to become a pilot over there. He first flew for the local company, Philair, to complete the 1,000 hours of flying required to get a license. He went back for his second three-month attachment on June 24, 2010, when he was 39 years old. Over time, he became more concerned about the airline and the flying ability of his fellow pilot, Danny Philemont who also owned the company, and it got to the point where Chris expressed to his brother Martin that he didn't want to fly with Danny anymore. He said he couldn't even read the plane's instruments properly, and he didn't know how Danny was still alive. His flying was so bad. Never something you want to hear about another pilot, right? He also mentioned how passengers would walk around making the plane unstable and would stand up when they were supposed to have their seatbelts on. It was also normal for chickens and other animals to be on the planes. Apparently, a crocodile 
about two to three feet long, had been smuggled onto the plane in a carry-on bag during their flight on August 25th, 2010. The unnamed passenger intended to sell the reptile once they landed. 21 passengers were on board along with three crew, including Chris Wilson. It was a round-robin domestic flight from Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of the Congo, to three other cities, and at 1 p.m. that day, it was headed to its last location when it suddenly nosedived and crashed about a half mile from the runway. 19 people were ended up, they were killed on impact. Two survivors were rushed to the hospital, but only one would survive. And investigators initially noticed no sign of a post-impact fire and thought the plane might have exhausted its fuel before it could land. Other possibilities were maintenance issues, a fatal stall and spin, pilot error, or engine failure. Some suggested the plane might have been sabotaged by a rival company. Another possibility, though, was a surge of passengers toward the front of the plane, making it, you know, making that weight distribution uneven. But what was the real reason? Luckily, the sole survivor had an explanation for the crash. They said the plane was beginning its descent when the smuggled crocodile escaped from its duffel bag. The flight attendant who first discovered the reptile panicked, screamed, and rushed toward the cockpit of the plane. Because, I mean, even a two, three foot crocodile is on a plane, that's going to be pretty, pretty scary. And I hear they're pretty fast, too. Yeah. If you get them running. I mean, and just to be shocked to see a crocodile on a what plane. Is like, what is this doing here? Yeah. What is going on? Like, oh my God. Not knowing what else was going on, this caused a panic in the rest of the passengers, so they all began rushing away from the crocodile toward the cockpit, and this shift in weight on the plane caused its center of gravity to shift toward the front, and this resulted in a, quote, irrecoverable loss of control. The plane then nosedived into the ground and smashed into a mud and brick house with a straw roof. Luckily, no one was inside the house, but the plane kept sliding and eventually rammed into another house where it stopped. Unfortunately, the Congolese government never released the plane's black box, which is a flight data recorder installed on every plane, and to this day, no one knows the official cause of the crash, but many believe it was caused by the smuggled crocodile. According to NBC News, the crocodile survived the crash, but was later killed with a machete. Ugh. Just brutal. At least yeah. let the crocodile go. Like I He know. should have never been on there in the first place, and all those people would still be alive had that man decided not to smuggle a crocodile on a plane. Yeah. And this is, I've never really considered weight distribution on a plane before I was kind of talking about, I, especially on smaller planes, I really had no idea that could cause a plane to nosedive, but it makes complete sense. I think even the commercial jetliners, it's the same way. Yeah. I think, I know I've seen they've, when flights are uneven, you know, if they're not completely full, they'll shift people around even. And I definitely know with the luggage, it's very strategic about how they organize the luggage down there. And that makes that's sense. also why they weight check your bags. Yeah. Make sure they don't carry too much weight. Yeah. Makes sense. But man, I, I never but thought on those small planes. Yeah. Yeah. As violent as that. That's terrifying. Half a mile from the runway too. God. These days we're all super busy. It seems like, and the last thing we want to do at the end of a long week or a long day is try to like budget, figure out your expenses, your finances. That's where Rocket Money has truly saved the day for me personally and so many others out there. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions. It monitors your spending and helps lower your bills so that you can grow your savings. With Rocket Money, I have full control over my subscriptions and a clear view of my expenses. It's an app I've been using for a while now and I pay for the premium version of it, which is highly worth it. The free version is great as well to kind of give you a taste of just how easy managing your finances can truly be. But I love how the dashboard shows me this month's spending compared to last month. I can clearly see my spending habits. Plus, it'll help me create a custom budget and keep my spending on track. Rocket Money will even try to negotiate lower bills for you, which who doesn't want to have lower bills, right? And they can do this by up to 20%. All you have to do is submit a picture of your bill and then Rocket Money takes care of the rest. They'll even deal with the customer service for you, which absolutely love and 100% go try to send all the bills you can. There's some they can do, there's some they can't do, but at least try to see what they can do for you. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and saved a total of $500 million in canceled subscriptions, which are always such a pain to manage, saving members up to $740 a year when using all of the app's features. Another feature I love too is 
The credit monitoring is great. And also it will tell you what your net worth is based on your personal finances, which is really cool. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash lights out. That's rocketmoney.com slash lights out. Check it out today at rocketmoney.com slash lights out. Our next vacation disaster is way more unsuspecting than crocodile on an airplane. And you know what? Most beachgoers probably wouldn't even think that this common activity for kids could, could be so dangerous. But earlier this year, the Mattingly family from Fort Wayne, Indiana, that's where my grandparents used to live, decided to go on vacation to South Florida for a nice, you know, just beach getaway. Jason and Therese decided on Lauderdale by the Sea, which is a charming village on the Atlantic coast. And they brought along their two children, Maddox, who was nine years old, and Sloan, who was seven years old. Sloan was, you know, just a typical, kind, seven-year-old girl. She loved unicorns and Taylor Swift. Same. Her father called her a beam of light, and she would wake up every day and start fist pumping, which I love that. That's hilarious. I wish I, I should embody that attitude. In wake my up everyday every day and fist just pumping fist to pumping. Taylor Swift. Yeah, let's go. But one day on vacation, she and Maddox, her brother, were on the beach and they decided to dig a hole, which I love this. I mean, that's what I did. I would go up on Lake Huron and just start digging a hole because it's fun. Like any curious kid, you know, you want to see how large you can get it. Could you make it to China is what we always said yep, as kids, you yep. know? After hours of digging and scraping away the sand, they eventually got the hole about five to six feet deep, which is a very deep hole. And they didn't realize really how dangerous this was at the time. As it turns out, which I didn't know this, experts advise not digging a beach hole any deeper than the knee height of the shortest person involved, since basically sand can shift at any moment. And around 3 p.m. that day, that is exactly what happened. Basically, just in the blink of an eye, the sand gave way, the hole collapsed in on itself, and the sand immediately became compact and extremely heavy. I mean, if you've ever dealt with like wet sand before, it's so heavy and it's so dense. So imagine that just the sand shifting and you're locked. Yeah, it becomes it. like concrete almost. Yeah. It's, and yeah. Both, both Maddox and Sloan were inside the hole. Maddox was trapped, but he was only luckily just buried up to his chest. But Sloan was nowhere to be seen. She was somewhere lost beneath the surface. As Maddox screamed for help, Jason and Therese ran over to help their children. Other beachgoers who heard the noise also rushed over. And once they all realized that Sloan was buried beneath the surface, they began clawing into the sand trying to get her out as fast as they possibly could. One woman had been in the water with her grandchildren and she heard the screaming. Once she got back to the beach, she immediately called emergency services. And this is one of five 911 calls that came in that day. Let's listen in. I'm on the beach in front of high noon and there's a child that they're trying to get. Oh, there's a bunch of people trying to do it. Okay, okay, okay. You're on the beach where? High noon at Lauderdale by the sea. Okay, tell me exactly what happened. The beach right in front of high noon. Okay, tell me exactly what happened. Oh, I hear the father started yelling for help. Uh -huh. This child is caught in a hole in the sand. They were digging. Child caught in the hole. Child is caught in a hole. Give me a. Okay, stay on the line. This woman stayed on the line for six minutes while people kept trying to find Sloan. I mean, you can imagine just the sheer panic and everybody's down there trying to dig her out as quickly as they possibly can. The sheriff arrived a few minutes later and countless beachgoers had crowded around the collapsed hole. They'd been frantically digging and using support boards to keep the sand from falling back into the hole as they dug. Because that's the first thing that came to my mind is just how hard it is if the sand is moving and that big of a hole, it's like nearly impossible to dig the sand out without it like falling back in or it continuing to collapse in on itself right. the more you try to dig it out. And I'm assuming, you know, no one has like metal shovels and right even if you did have metal shovels you wouldn't want to be you know stabbing it into the ground where potentially someone is so yeah this whole scenario it's like, what is do you do yeah. yeah and and i mean you know she's in there and she's quickly running out of air and being suffocated so it's just oh uh as a parent i'm just like it's just kills me to even think about what 
Oh, oh God. I just can't even imagine what that must've been like. No. So they very quickly realized they didn't have the proper tools to get slown out and they didn't even know exactly where to dig. So they waited for the fire crew to assist. Maddox wasn't buried too deep, plus he had air. His father, Jason, was able to rescue him fairly quickly, and they placed him into a police cruiser until ambulances arrived. But here's Therese explaining what happened next. People were desperate to help you. I only knew of one. Um, It was a woman who she, I told her to call 911, and then it turned out she's a nurse. Once Maddox got out of, our son got out of the sand, and they were checking him out on the beach, she stayed with him because, like, I wanted to be digging and so she sat with him the whole time and she was just um so kind as heartbreaking as that is i it is a bit hopeful seeing how quick everyone around them was willing to help out immediately not only with digging but clearly that woman was willing to just watch over her son as she ran back to dig So Jason knew that Sloan was still buried somewhere beneath or adjacent to her brother, which made her much harder to find. And time was against them at this point, because most humans can only survive about three to five minutes buried in sand. About the maximum time someone can hold their breath, pretty much. Being buried in sand is almost the same as being underwater. It's unclear how long Sloan had been underneath the sand, but when they finally found her and pulled her out, she was covered in sand, unresponsive and without a pulse. Unfortunately, she was pronounced dead when she arrived, at the Broward Health Medical Center in Fort Lauderdale. Her brother Maddox survived, and the family said that their entire lives have been turned upside down ever since this freak accident. Therese Sloan's mother soon posted a GoFundMe page for her daughter on February 21st, 2024, and she said, quote, A freak accident happened yesterday while we were on vacation, and it took away our greatest seven and a half years. Don't tell us you're sorry for our loss. Don't do that to us. We experienced the purest human being, and we are forever changed by her. We love you beyond any stretch of the imagination, our sweet Sloan, what we would give. And we'll also link that GoFundMe as well. But Therese and Jason were later interviewed by Good Morning America, and here's some of what they had to say. We go to the beach, we think of water safety, and this never, ever once crossed my mind. And of course, looking now, I'm like, of course. And so that part's really frustrating. Yeah. Last month, seven-year-old Sloan and her nine-year-old brother Maddox were digging in the sand at this Fort Lauderdale area beach when things took a devastating turn. The sand hole suddenly caved in on them. Sloan was completely buried beneath her brother. Jason, you told me this happened in an instant. It's kind of a blur and it's probably maybe my mind protecting itself, but it just happened so fast. And in my mind, I had her in my hands but the weight of the sand was too much. It didn't matter that we were literally right there. It was just a hole and there's nothing. And then it just became chaos and horror. And here's their final message. If we can do anything to save another family from going through this, whether that's signage, uh, beach patrol, and strangers, you know, if you see something that's dangerous, take the courage and say something. Yeah, that's honestly a great point. I'm surprised. I mean, I've never seen any signs about digging in the sand Me on the beach either. Yeah. I didn't even know that this was a possibility before coming across this story. I mean, it's and that's just what something the, that you would never think about. That's what the mom was saying too. You always think of like swimming safety and they do have, you know, you'll see signs swim at your own risk or no lifeguard on duty or whatever. You think the water is the danger, but I, yeah, you just never expect something like this to happen. Oh, it's just devastating though. Just in an instant, I mean, they're having this wonderful family vacation and in just a split second, it, it completely changes into a parent's worst nightmare. I mean, I just can't even imagine just how helpless you would feel knowing that your, your daughter is buried, you know, buried alive in the sand and there's nothing you can do about it. It's just so tragic. But there is also a GoFundMe for, for Sloan. Uh, organized by her family and uh we're gonna go ahead and donate to that as well and we uh, encourage you to you know make a donation no matter how big or small and you know send some positive words to to her family because i I just can't even imagine going through that and uh, it's just such a freak thing and you know i think the positive is that we can all just be more careful when we're 
at at the beach at the ocean yeah, yeah. i've honestly learned a lot from this episode alone yeah, on same. what i should need to be aware of when traveling the maddington family also said they didn't place any blame on lauderdale by the sea where they were staying in response to the tragedy the community created a national safety campaign and shared it with as many coastal communities as possible to hopefully stop something like this from happening again oh man but we're going to end today's episode with a still a horrible uh yeah. end to many many people's vacations but uh, but, but a, not bit, quite as... a bit more i don't know it's uh we don't have any deaths for this next one uh or well God, fuck i guess we have like a death adjacent to this one but we're gonna try and lighten the mood a little bit here um especially after that last one you know because you we'll, we'll try and balance the scales all right i'm trying to say and uh yeah we're gonna shift gears because you know what some real life nightmare situations are just as simple as a little bit of negligence and some poor sewage management mm. i wanted to ask you josh before we dig into this have you ever dealt with your you're a homeowner uh have you ever dealt with sewage problems oh yeah okay yeah have you ever dealt with poop sewage problems no thank okay. god i've not had any uh backflow good my system yet good or good overflow other than like clogged toilets here and there okay yeah but, i uh, i have really yeah so I owned, please tell us I owned a home. what's your uh poop experience luckily it wasn't as bad as it could have been i've actually two times one was my parents house the other was my house i used to own a home and you just clogged Kermit. the pipes or what I, yeah my shits were just so solid good that god they just dude. clogged everything up no so the first one long story short big flood came in uh just swamped all the suburbs of metro detroit including my parents house and the, basically the flood water came back through like the septic systems and, oh wow and uh everybody's basements were just poop uh, oh. poop water in everybody's basements and the next few weeks just the all the streets and city blocks were lined with people throwing out all the couches and furniture that were in there because it oh was all God. soiled by by poop water my parents had to rip out a bunch of the drywall oh damn all the carpeting and everything and yeah, how was, deep was it it, in their basement, the at the deepest point, we were probably like a foot and a half, maybe two feet. Just brown, smelly. Yep, smelled like death. It was awful. Oh my God. And I had, at the time, we didn't have our practice space yet in Detroit, and we were still playing music in my parents' basement. So I had to fucking run down there, get my drum set, elevate all the You're amplifiers. Like, must save the drum like set. thousands of dollars worth of band equipment down there. I was like, oh my God. Luckily, I, I had it elevated just on chairs and stuff. So the poop water st luckily stopped before it reached the equipment oh, and, God. and went back down. Not a fun time. I probably should have caught some weird disease as I was trudging through the poop water down there, but luckily I didn't. And then the only other time was, it was like two weeks after I bought my house in Hamtramck. I go downstairs and this sewage system, I mean, it's like a hundred years old. It's very old pipes, but something got clogged in the in the sewage main sewage drain out to the alley and i come in and it's not in my basement it is only inside the utility sink it was like three feet of shit water i don't know why it, it was like stopping just in the utility sink but wasn't like hadn't clogged back into the rest of oh, the basement. oh weird very strange couldn't figure that one out but luckily my dad and i we just got a long snake from Home Depot. Snake there you go. Thing, and luckily it drained and we were good. I didn't have to pay. They were, the plumbing company was quoting me like $3,000 on a yeah. huge repair. But now nah, my dad and I just snaked it out. We yeah, were sewage repairs are not. That's why they're always like, I mean, you were a home inspector, you know. Like, oh, yeah. Send the yeah. camera down the sewer line. Make sure you're not going to run into an issue there because yep. that's yep. a very expensive repair bill. Yeah, my house. I don't know if you're in a home plumbing, but we. it was <laughs> like an old, it was an old like pee trap. Basically, oh, because okay. fun fact before we get into poop, old houses, I didn't know this. They didn't have, you know how everything has a pee trap right, now? Yeah. All your toilets, all your sinks. Back in the day, I guess in Hamtramck, when they were first building houses, it just had everything went straight down and the house had a pee trap. And that was the only trap. 
in the house. Oh, interesting. Isn't that huh. weird? So if that thing failed, the you, whole the house is screwed. Just, yeah, and you, mm. it would just reek. And of course, they put it like beneath the cement of the basement, which is the Where least it's like accessible. impossible to access it. You have <laughs> yeah. to dig up the whole foundation. <laughs> yeah. To, damn. So a little bit of, a little bit of, uh, I don't know. I feel bad for all the people that were are like eating while listening to this. Or <laughs> yeah, sorry was, guys. <laughs> sorry. This is a. Ri- I mean, we really jerk you in a lot of directions on this <laughs> yeah. one. Jesus. Yeah. Well, imagine being on a floating pile of shit. Yes, which is literally what we're about to get into. <laughs> literally, it's an island of poop. So cruise lines. This is, is a segue. Re- this story just. I I've never been on like a big big cruise. And I don't know if I ever will after hearing this story. Yeah, this is this is scary enough. Cruise lines, it's a $30 billion industry. Makes sense, but kind of surprised me. It's Carnival, a mafia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's be honest. It's a it's a shit mafia. They but, just get you boozed up and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> disaster happens. So Carnival, which is a company that's based out of Miami. They would see a massive dip in earnings in 2013. They went down the shitter, you'd say, hey. huh? <laughs> and yeah, for very good reason, they went down the shitter. People often think, you know, luxury, relaxation. I don't. <laughs> I don't. Sunny weather. People try to convince me otherwise that, <laughs> oh yeah, go on a cruise, it'll be fun. It'll be a luxurious vacation. No, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. And, uh, you know, it's common. You go in the Caribbean, maybe you're going down to Mexico, maybe you're going up the Alaskan coast. This is a pretty I common I would maybe thing. consider the Alaskan cruise. That is the only- Because I hear good things about that That's one. the only cruise I would ever consider because it's the easiest way to access right. Alaska because inland, it's very hard to travel through. So really, you get the best spots by going on boat. So that is the only one I think <laughs> as an adult I would consider doing on a, on a cruise ship. Everything else, no, I'm good. 3,143 passengers were on board this cruise ship. 1,100 staff members. You know, they they boarded this carnival ship. It was called the Triumph. And they all eat a lot of food on cruise ship. Yes. You're at the buffet. They say you gain 20 pounds on on a week cruise. 20 pounds? Yeah. Where's that fact from? I don't know. (laughs) You might have to to fact check on that, Danny. Dude, can you even gain 20 pounds in a week? That's crazy. Yeah. Honestly, though, like between all the sugary alcoholic drinks and the food all everywhere. The food, yeah. And you're not exercising. You're just laying by the pool. Yeah. What like, are you going to run around it. the track on the ship? Like <laughs> yeah. run circles? Like, <laughs> yeah. Or swim in the little like bathtub they call a pool. Right. Yeah. There's not much exercise. So, yeah. I mean, we're big cruise haters, as you can tell. Yeah. But yeah. I know you'll, they have the see. new ship, that Icon of the Seas, that's like, oh, ooh, yeah, it's the yeah. biggest ship ever or whatever. Yeah. Kind of looks a little cool, but. There's an old Bill Burr joke where he's like, you know what? If all the cruise ships in the world just suddenly sank, might, might be a blessing in disguise out here. Honestly, and like going back to the pandemic, dude, like yeah. how bad that was. Yes. Like, oh, man. So, yeah. And I, all the people that go missing on cruises and yeah we there's were lots of sketchy about, shit there was a, we could do a, an entire episode on just people disappearing on cruise ships and why sure. you should never go on a cruise why, yes. we're never gonna get a cruise ship sponsor now because no. they're gonna see this and i'm okay with that I, honestly i won't me shed too. a tear yet. me too did you could you fact check that danny 20 pounds danny's like this is a bunch of bullshit this yeah. is like ash jeeves over here <laughs> so i did fact check it and i mean you you do technically gain anywhere between like seven to ten pounds on a cruise, but it's not weight that sustains. It usually falls off within a week afterwards. Interesting. Water weight, just a bunch yeah, of water. Yeah, water weight, inflammation, and just undigested food is kind of nice. what it is. <laughs> All the clogged colons. <laughs> yeah. Woo. So. Because you're eating that pizza, that oh, yeah. pizza they just keep bringing Super out. Super doughy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And the ship, you know, it's going, all your digestive system's kind of getting sloshed around a little bit. How much vomit do you think goes down the <laughs> toilets on cruise ships? You know, if you're on a cruise and you're not vomiting Maybe overboard, someone's listening on a cruise right now <laughs> yeah. and like, I need to get off. And we haven't even gotten to the story If yet. you're trapped at sea right now, good luck. All I can suggest is vomit overboard so no one has to deal with it. <laughs> Maybe poop overboard because you're going to see why... The sewage system is a, is a huge problem on these ships. But yeah, it's called the Triumph. 
And you know what? No one realized what type of stinky poop they were about to get into. The Triumph would soon become known as, what better name for it than the Poop Cruise. At the time, the ship was about 900 feet. This is a big boy. This is a big boy. It had 13 decks, three swimming pools, seven whirlpools, and a casino. I wow, know. all yeah. things I could get in Vegas. <laughs> yeah, I know. In a, you could get in a, in a landlocked, uh, non-poop-ridden place. Well, I don't know. Vegas probably has a bunch of poop, but that's all right. This ship, I'll admit it. It ha- it has the potential for some endless fun in the sun, but you know what? Yeah, if you're <laughs> completely sloshed, maybe like <laughs> I don't think I could. Do, do they it. water down the alcohol on cruises? Do we know? They, oh, they like must. they do at resorts. They must. I would it's, imagine they do just for for safety reasons. Yeah, it yeah. seems like a liability. Since there's right? the rails everywhere yeah, over to the seriously. open ocean. Uh, but you know what? On the Triumph, oh man. After only a couple days setting sail from Galveston, Texas, where my parents used to live, this ship, it was just in the middle of the ocean, and it, it ran into some serious, serious problems. On February 7th, 2013, it set sail into the Gulf of Mexico. Originally, it was supposed to be a four-day cruise. First day was, you know, business as usual, as you can <laughs> expect. Drunk people, mediocre buffet food. Some boomer entertainment. You know, there's some magicians yeah, and some shit on there. Comedy clubs with some no name. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Comedian. Yep. It's like they, they got a they got carrot top or some shit out there. <laughs> hey man, I like carrot top. <laughs> sorry if there's any carrot top fans out there. I'm sorry. And you know, there's probably the one good thing about these cruises is there's probably some great weather out there in the oceans. The sun is shining. You get that constant breeze, but They were heading to the island of Cozumel, Mexico, and once there, they docked, they disembarked, they went shopping, they ate, they swam, they returned, and as the ship headed back across the gulf to return home in Galveston, the fun was over pretty fast. Yeah, I guess in the early morning of February 10th at 5.28 a.m., you know, you're still snoozing, fire alarms are going off. The ship's PA called for an alpha to respond, and this is typically a code for a medical emergency on the ship. Guests on the first and second deck began to panic. Smoke filled the hallways just outside their doors, and passengers immediately ran to get life jackets and search for friends and family. So this fun cruise is now starting to turn into a nightmare. Up on the top deck, guests could see excessive bills of smoke coming from the smokestack. In confusion, many ran to evacuation stations, and the next few announcements coming through the PA asked for everyone to remain calm. Uh, Here's a video someone took of the announcements telling people to return to their cabins. They literally give you that safety instruction at the beginning to go to the uh, evacuation stations in case of emergency, like, no, no, no. Go back to your room. Yeah, and I'm, I'm assuming they people on board know naval codes. It's like medical emergency, uh, right. code alpha, and they're seeing smoke come up from the ship. Yeah, let's look at this this engine fire going on yeah. here. So imagine going out and seeing smoke billowing out of the engine. They're like, no, 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 we're good. Yeah, everything's fine. If this were me too, 5 a.m. on a cruise ship, my head is throbbing because I drank too much the day before. Yep. And I'm like, I can't deal with this right now. Your stomach's also hurting. Yeah. (laughs) Because you're hungover and you haven't pooped yet. Yes. Because you ate so much last night that it's not ready to come out. Yeah. And that's going to come up later. That's going to be potentially in jeopardy because the fucking boat's on fire. Dude, th- this is, no. Uh, yeah. No thanks. I'm good. I'm good. So the power surged, and then it went out, leaving only the emergency lights on. Air conditioning units stopped working, which that is just a non-negotiable for me. That's when I just leave. I'm like, <laughs> I don't care how much money it takes. Fly me a helicopter here. I'm getting off this damn boat. Which, on a boat, in those cabins, if air circulation goes off, those rooms it's like a sauna yeah yeah so small and especially if you're a family you have a bunch of bodies in there i mean it's going to get so hot and uncomfortable yeah and i'm I'm assuming like it's really humid out there too yeah right? true very true yeah. makes it 10 times worse 
Meanwhile, a fire raged in the main generating plant. Luckily, the automatic system put out the blaze by 6.08 a.m., which I guess that's a good thing. They have an automatic system. But the fire had already caused enough damage. Four necessary engines had been disabled, and the Triumph now didn't have electricity. The diesel-electric propulsion system was inoperable. The 4,200 people on board were now stranded in the Gulf. Two tugboats were immediately dispatched. The plan was to tug the Triumph back to the closest port in Progreso, Mexico. Once this plan was relayed to guests, the panic fizzled out, which I don't know if I believe that, <laughs> yeah, honestly. Yeah. I think that was I mean, more I guess PR. maybe that's better than like, oh, the boat's going to sink at this point, but... This is, we're going to, we're going to stay afloat. I would be, I would be absolutely panicked knowing that there's no electricity, no air conditioning, and who knows how long it'll take for two little tugboats to pull this thing back to the port. Coming from shore and yeah. in the middle of the ocean. It's going to take a while, right? I think the people who could connect the dots started realizing like, no. At least we're not stranded idea. out here for who knows how long, like yeah. help is coming. Right. Yeah. But so, still, yeah. You, you know, you're nodding for a good time here though. But many removed their life vests and they were told they'd be back to land in about just a, just a quick little two days. But the truth was it would be another several miserable days until anyone got off of the boat. Woo. So you think it's bad? Well, it's yeah. only the beginning. Yep. Later that morning, guests realized that the fire had also cut any running water and the septic system was now disabled. Woo. All right. So no one could or no one should have used the toilets. Instead, it was announced the guests would soon be delivered red biohazard bags. These would become iconic to the red biohazard bags. Like every news media across the nation were, were taking pictures of these red biohazard bags because they would be all over the ship because they were told these were specifically used for, quote, a number two, a poop. The staff then left bins outside the cabins for people to drop the bags into for disposal. They also told everyone to do a number one, a wee in the showers. Oh, God. <laughs> the hell, dude? So here's the problem is that it, you know, it took a while for these bags to get handed out. And by now, you know, if you're like me, you said I was full of poop by now. Well, if you got to go, you got to go. You got to go. If the red bags aren't here, I'm sorry, I got to shit. What do you want me to lean over the railing and try to <laughs> shit off the sides? Like, what do you do? So yeah, people were still going in the toilets because they had nowhere else to go. I don't blame them. I don't blame them. And some people just re outright refused to use the bags. They said, no, I'm a civilized ape. I will not be pooping in a bag. They really think bags is the best backup option here. Right? Like, can't have like... There's got to be at least some like porter potties or something that yeah. they could set up or like. How is there no other system? I don't know. Nah, Oops. pooping on back. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you paid a lot for that presidential suite, <laughs> didn't you? <laughs> well, they got the gold bags. They didn't get the regular red bags if you were in the presidential suite. I just keep suite. imagining like the fucking little like, like diaper genies or something. Like, how about just diapers? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Just sit in your soil for a little bit. We'll be back to shore We'll soon. bring you a diaper, an extra diaper genie. <laughs> oh, your kid has diapers? Use those. <laughs> yeah, get those going. Man, honestly, though, this, maybe it is a good, bring bring a few pairs of Depends uh, adult diapers yeah. when you go on a cruise. Absolutely. Who knows what could happen, you know? Yeah, and then make these great little uh, bags for poopy diapers that block the smell. There you go. Yeah. Are Do you have a diaper service for, for Ollie? What the fuck is a diaper service? You never service? heard of a diaper service? What's a diaper service? I think service? maybe it's an old school thing. My mom used Someone to Someone comes it. to your house and changes your kid? No, no. <laughs> that would be crazy. That'd be nice. <laughs> no, you actually, it was like this service. It was reusable diapers. My mom did Oh, hell no, dude. I don't fuck and with that. And you put it, you like left it outside and the service would come pick it up and drop off. Fresh washed, ones? Yeah, fresh oh. cloth diapers. Yeah, I wish I was that, that cool, but. <laughs> yeah. No, diaper, I mean. These babies, man, they can drop some some bombs. Man. Yeah. So you got that going on along with all the adults going on. Yeah. So there's just poop. Uh, Your shower adding, smells like a fucking here. urinal. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Without the urinal cakes. Dude, what? No water? So you're just pit trying to piss in the drain? Yeah. Since, since their system ran off these uh, electrical generators, these diesel and electrical generators. Uh, everything and the backups just, failed. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. Those were essentially the backups. That was, those so were the So there's no backups of the backup. No. There's no solar 
battery pack. No, no one. This was an oversight. Everyone was like, ah, we're good. Carnival, the yeah. fuck, man. And we'll get into it a little bit later of what really went down because I, I think Carnival is pretty responsible for this. But we'll get into the actual details of what happened with those generators that I find pretty fascinating. But back to the poop. You know what? Some people, they were just like, I'm not using these bags. Some people were just refusing to eat. They're like, you don't eat, you don't poop. Uh, yeah, that's, that's smart. That's, that's, that's the solution smart. here. Until you pass out because you're so hungry. <laughs> yeah. Then you have a real medical emergency. Seriously, yeah. Then what are you going to do? And this wasn't even the worst part. Fire, it also knocked out the ship's stabilizers. Here's where the real chaos oh, begins. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. Because the ship started listing pretty severely. And listing, it's a, for those of you who don't know, nautical term for when a ship begins to tilt to one side. So, I mean, just imagine put two and two together poop listing you can see yeah have you ever been in a porter potty and someone tried to tip it over on yeah, you yeah it's kind of no, like that exactly so toilets began they just began spilling oh. out all their contents and depending on where the drains were placed and how hard the ship tilted at any given moment this was tilting because of the wind so the wind would just shift this boat back and forth and slosh some of the toilets though if it listed hard enough <laughs> the water would move so fast that the toilets would actually erupt like a volcano. <laughs> oh my yeah, god, let's what? Go. Oh. My. <laughs> That's you, a phenomenon you don't see every day yeah. an erupting toilet. Have you guys ever heard of the movie called Triangle of Sadness? No, do I want to know about it? Yes, it's actually I love this movie. Uh is it's, erupting toilets in it? Yes. It's actually, I think, I want to say it was inspired by this because, I mean, I don't know what else. Uh, Ruben Ostland is the director. I don't know what else he would be inspired by, but it's a bunch of rich people on this cruise ship. And there's like, I don't want to spoil it, but shit, shit goes shit down. Shit goes down. Yeah. <laughs> it goes down. It's an incredible movie. I highly recommend it. Triangle of Sadness. Go, go check it out. Huh. Very much reminded me of what's Is it a comedy? Here. Yeah, it's like a drama comedy. Very good movie. But so we got erupting toilets in the rooms. Yep. People are in their rooms because that's where they told them to go. Exactly. Go back to your cabins. Can right? you fucking imagine that, dude? <laughs> You're laying on the bed. You're sweating. You're probably close to naked because you're so hot. Yep. Yep. And you've got to take a shit, but your toilet's clogged. Yep. And all of a sudden, your toilet erupts. Yes. There's poop particles flying through the air. <laughs> you get covered in poop. And the ship, the ship is yeah, tilting. Yeah, and you're flying around. You're you're getting clubbed in the head by your your luggage bags. Dude, this is hell on earth, right? This here. is this hell is, on This earth. has got to be a level of hell. This is at least the fifth circle. Like I would what imagine. on earth? And so you know, this excrement was seeping through the cabins out into the halls. The, the carpets were getting soaked up. When the wind picked up, you know, the, it would shift again. The sewage would seep through the walls and the ceilings. This was just like poop moving through out everything. You're in a prison of poop. <laughs> Literally. Dude, I feel so bad. There's kids on board this. I feel so I bad know, for the kids, right? dude. God. Fuck the adults. The kids I, are... <laughs> that's all I care about. I would, I would take me a while to forgive my parents for being like, why did you put me through the poop hell? Oh, on that cruise ship kids would be so confused and oh so my, upset screaming yeah. crying like oh absolutely I, and so mom it smells like poop <laughs> <laughs> my daughter would just be saying poop she just says <laughs> poop just all the time identify it every time she she toots she says poop instead and we're like oh, did nice. you poop or <laughs> did you toot <laughs> yeah come on you she only says poop difference. she'll we're learn like, no you didn't poop <laughs> Sometimes I don't know the difference when, <laughs> I, when I fart and shit. Was that a two? Like, that was pretty poop. strong fart. So, you know, these. Sorry, this is like TMI ish. I don't know what happened in this episode. We've just absolutely derailed here <laughs> on this poop cruise. Woo. Woo. All right. So, you know. It's the, starting to smell like poop in here, actually. Today. Yeah. I have Eddie? an innate sense for poop. Did you, you all right over there? Yeah, you look good. constipated. Yes. <laughs> all mine went out a couple weeks ago. All right. <laughs> all right good. Good. So, you know what? You could just imagine, uh, you know, the hallway. I don't so want to imagine. It's moving outside of the cabins, too. It's not even isolated to the cabins. And it's reaching where they were told to put their poop bags, you know, because they were oh, finding no. the walls where they put the poop bags. So, it's just it's mayhem. 
mayhem in the cabin. Almost 5,000 people on board this boat. Right. And you know what? To top it off, you remember, you, you said you were out, but lack of air conditioning. So it was hot as steamy. So imagine this. It's this, the smell mixed with the heat. This is unbearable. So one person later described it as being locked in a porta potty for days. <laughs> oh my God, dude. This is, this is horrible, man. This <laughs> is awful. Ugh. This is terrible. This is torturous. This is. This is. Locked in a porter potty for days, dude. Yup. I mean, I don't know. Ugh, man. And I don't, you know, I, I don't blame how people responded to this. I think people no. got smart. People were like, there's no way in hell we're staying in these cabins. No, and they're like, fuck this. I'm not, you expect me to sleep in here until we get back to shore? Right. So they started taking their mattresses out and setting them on the ship's decks, which is a good move. I would just immediately get to open air. Yeah. Hundred, but is that dangerous without the stabilizer? I'm like, <laughs> just, your mattress starts yeah, sliding. Like, it's the fucking chip. My God, what do you even do? And soon, news outlets were flying their helicopters overhead to get a look at the mayhem. <laughs> this is such. Well, this is such first world shit. They're like, that's not a wave. It's just poop sliding down the deck. Yeah. So from from above, they see all these. Massive white bed sheets being put up on the tanning deck. Towels and rope tied them together and become known as Tent City. So this luxurious carnival cruise vacation boat is now looks like a yeah. It, it's like a, a I don't know if this is offensive, but it looks like a refugee camp. It's like people had to quickly set up shop somewhere that they didn't realize they would have to. Yeah. This, it's kind of crazy to see the pictures of this. If you're if you're listening, I highly recommend taking a look at yeah. this. This is wild. And it's so funny that the water slide is like behind them. It's like fun. Disaster. <laughs> and and they literally have to put bed sheets up to just create shade because you're out in the ocean, so you're just getting hammered by UV rays out yeah. there. To make things even more insane though, Carnival hosted an open bar <laughs> to like what what do we have to give these people? All right, fuck it. Free beer and wine. Drink drink your sorrows away. <laughs> Uncle Jim's just going to get loaded. Like, you can imagine the problems that would arise from this. And not to mention, all that drinking leads to more watery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At least urine. I mean, yeah, for I sure. Mean, how many times do you go pee when you're out drinking? Yeah. A lot. True. The bar service ran from noon to midnight. Just the whole hours. day. <laughs> the whole day. Some even said they were served as late as 2 a.m. Quickly, countless passengers are getting hammered and begin acting up. So couple alcohol with the fact that people are sleeping on the deck, coupled with it smells like shit. There's no bathrooms. Dude, this is why this is like fire festival level <laughs> fuckery. Like oh my god. Oh god. So then people just are getting fed up. They're like, fuck this. Start throwing things off the side of the ship and intentionally sabotaging bathrooms. Uh, you know what? I don't blame them. I might even join them. If I had enough drinks in me, I might start sabotaging the, the cruise ship as well at this rate. I'm surprised people didn't just like riot and try to go for the captain. <laughs> like taking <laughs> the ship over. Oh my God. Full blown mutiny. But it was also rumored that some of the staff was even drunk as well, which don't blame them, honestly. Yep. By Tuesday morning, two days after the engine fire, the tugboats finally arrived, but now the Triumph had drifted 90 miles north from where it had broken down, so it was now closer to the U.S. mainland. They changed plans to tug the ship, which weighed an unimaginable 102,000 gross tons, all the way down to Mobile, Alabama. And that would, guess what, take another few days. This also made it easier for reentry for the 900 people on board without passports, but this caused a serious problem for one of the passengers, Rachel Alderette. She was on dialysis about three times a week, and she was about to be past due for her next treatment. And let's hear Rachel. I mean, that's what I think of too, is the people with medical issues right. and like who who were only planning to be on the ship for a certain amount of time before they have to go do another treatment or, I mean, or medication. Who you knows run out why? of medication. Yeah. Even. Like, yeah. It's serious stuff. All right, let's hear what Rachel um, experience here. I need a kidney, so I needed to do dialysis. And I do it like three times a, a week. 
and I had already missed one day on a Saturday and um <clears throat> and the doctor had said that it was okay but I was supposed to be here on Monday and then Tuesday go to a dialysis you know when I was supposed to go but that's when the you know the boat got and it, it got caught on fire on Sunday they uh, got the coast guards and transferred me to another another boat another ship send me to Cozumel to do dialysis on Tuesday. It was hard. It was scary. It was, oh my God. You know, it, it was just scary the way they put me down. Uh, they put me in, in a stair rope and um, the Coast Guard said that don't worry about it, that they would catch me and, and you know, they were going to hold me back and they did. And then they transferred me to the bigger boat and, you know, it was good. Well, God bless the Coast Guard because... I mean, they they work miracles every day, and yeah. she was able to get off the boat. Well, it's like, why didn't they just, if they knew, didn't they know the boat was going to drift? Right. Sitting out there, why not? I guess they can't do anything, but why didn't they just have, like, the Coast Guard come straight away or send, like, a Coast Guard sh- ship down there? Probably could get down there pretty quick. True. It's not that much distance, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. I wonder what why the they think tugboats back to Mexico was maybe just, Distance wise, I that think made it was most distance, sense. and that's why they even took her to Mexico to do dialysis instead of back to the U.S. mainland. Because I think at some point they were closer to to Mexico. Well, the next day, another passenger had to be evacuated because of a pre-existing medical condition. Also, food began running low, and when people run out of food, all hell breaks loose. Yeah, passengers stayed in line for hours to get tiny boxes of cereal, ketchup on buns. A very delicious snack, cold cucumber sandwiches, or just candy. People began cutting in line, desperate for more food. That is scary. Some accuse others of taking more than their fair share, but they defend themselves, saying they need more for their family and not just themselves. With tensions high, people began getting into heated arguments and screaming at each other in food lines. Three nearby cruise ships dropped by to send over more food and water. High winds and rough waves made the transfer between ships pretty slow, though. After the supply drops, the tugboats began hauling the cruise liner again, but they could only reach speeds of about 5 miles per hour, and the tow line snapped several times, so it seems like a great backup plan. I'm more fascinated by the nearby cruise ships coming by and unloading, because that seems like terrible marketing, where you're like, another cruise ship is like... Yeah, it's hey, like we're Royal gonna... Caribbean's coming by, <laughs> yeah. like, hey, like, you want some of our filet mignon? Yeah, and also like all the passengers on the cruise ship that's still moving is like, that could be us yeah. pretty soon. But on Wednesday, February 13, Tent City had to be taken down as they needed room for a Coast Guard helicopter to drop off supplies and equipment, including a generator that would make hot meals possible again. So by the next day, things, you know, they were getting a little brighter. Staff was also able to restore and sanitize some of the bathrooms. Thank the Lord. By now, some people hadn't showered in days. And one passenger said, we're all just beyond disgusting. With the generator, guests could finally charge their phones again. Staying in contact with family and friends had also been a problem since the fire, and they could only catch the reception of some of the passerby cruise ships that came by. Even though things were looking up, some passengers laid down on the deck and spelled out the word help with their bodies. This is after things were even getting a little bit better. When the ship finally reached its destination, the Triumph became the first cruise ship to dock at Mobile, Alabama. It took six hours for the tugboats to maneuver it through a 30-mile channel. And at 10 p.m., February 14th, guests finally began to leave the ship after eight days at sea. So their trip doubled due yeah. to this. Yep. Once they got off, some were seen kissing the ground. They got to dry land. So dramatic, but I understand. One passenger, Kendall Jenkins, who was 24 years old, was crying and said, quote, I don't want to hear the word cruise ever again. Don't blame you yeah. at all. Yep. Meanwhile, loved ones had made their way to Mobile to wait for the ship to arrive, including the Carnival CEO, Gary Cahill. He's like, my ass is on the line. <laughs> yeah. I got to get down there. For the past three days, Carnival executives, they hadn't said a word about this situation. They had talked about it before, but then they kind of went radio silent until they understood that they could safely get everybody back to shore. When the Triumph finally reached Mobile, the CEO, Gary Cahill, finally made a statement after the radio silence. 
We pride ourselves in providing our guests with a great vacation experience, and clearly we failed in this particular case. Thanks, Gary. Uh, clearly we failed. Yeah. Yeah, you failed. <laughs> yeah. I think you definitely failed. It's kind of an understatement. Yeah. A little side note, I guess, he would retire the year after this. Oh, convenient. He was yeah. like, imagine going out with that on your right. conscience. Man. Oh, man. I, he probably cashed out and he has a ton of money, though. Yeah. Here's the next problem with this whole thing is that Supposedly in the fine print on the passenger's tickets, it said that Carnival wasn't liable for a breakdown of a vessel and they didn't have to refund the cruise. A CNN report also claimed the fine print said, quote, Carnival makes absolutely no guarantee for safe passage, a seaworthy vessel, adequate and wholesome food, and sanitary and safe living conditions. So, so never go on a Carnival <laughs> cruise yeah, because... <laughs> They don't guarantee anything. anything Your anything. safety included. Yeah. In response, Carnival said CNN's report was inaccurate. Carnival still offered all the passengers a full refund, a free flight home, a voucher for another cruise. Why would you even bother? Travel expenses included and five hundred dollars. But you know, some of the passengers saw five hundred bucks. Dude. I know, right? <laughs> you owe me. If I am locked in the fifth circle of poop hell, five hundred dollars will not cut it. And obviously, some of the passengers they just saw this as hush money. Either way, you know, it's a very calculated PR move. Someone had to figure out in Carnival. They had to figure out what would make this right. So that someone had to figure yeah. out $500 and all the other things precisely. I wonder if people had to sign something to get this too. Oh, yeah. I bet you there was some type of release that had to be like yeah. signed like in order to get the 500 talk bucks. Shit about us. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There's no way they're just giving them like $500 cash yeah. as they get off the boat or something. Yep. That'd be hilarious if they were evacuating the ship and there was like the team of carnival lawyers like handing out yeah. papers for people Please to sign. Please sign this and you'll get your free refund. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Uh, still within hours of making it home, passengers said, Oh, no, hell yeah. Fuck that. Yeah. Uh, countless lawsuits came flooding into Carnival, but they could only get compensated, unfortunately, if they suffered a personal injury on board. 27 passengers ended up getting a combined total of $118,500 from Carnival in damages. Not that much. Unfortunately, after you deduct attorney fees and considering that some of the passengers had come to Miami for the trial, Really, at the end of the day, some of the passengers might have lost money in the lawsuits. Uh, the payout wasn't that great. Damn. Yeah. Well, in the aftermath, Carnival announced a $300 million program to add emergency generators, upgrade fire safety, and improve engine rooms on all 24 of its ships. The company also said it would repay the U.S. government at an unspecified amount for the cost to taxpayers for the government aid to the Triumph in a previously disabled ship, the Splendor. Even then, the horror wasn't over, though. While the Triumph was docked in Mobile, high winds caused the ship to break away and drift across Mobile River. This is a cursed ship. Yeah, Jesus. Smashed into a U.S. Army Corps of Engineers dredge, causing a 20-foot gash and railing damage. One of the tugboats that responded to haul it back across the river accidentally became pinned between the dredge and the cruise ship. Meanwhile, two workers were inside a small guard shack on a 65-foot section of dock that collapsed. It was reported that high winds caused it to collapse. One worker was rescued and hospitalized, but the other worker was recovered dead nine days later. Jeez, man. Do you think that was just high winds? I don't know. Yeah. I'd have to like see the see the footage or the yeah. weather forecast for that day, but who knows? Maybe the Triumph caused that in some way. Repairs on the Triumph were then delayed. Two more cruises were canceled on the Triumph, and 14 Carnival cruises were canceled altogether because they're like, oh shit, we got to figure this out before we send our ships back out. As for what caused the initial fire, Carnival Investigation claimed there had been a fuel leak in the engine room that caught fire. In just two years, Carnival had nine incidents of fuel leaks in flexible fuel lines. In January 2013, Carnival demanded that all ships have spray shields for their diesel engine generators that use these flexible lines. Apparently, Triumph never had a proper shield installed to one of these lines, and this led to the massive fire. After the investigation, it was discovered that a fuel hose that caused the fire was underneath the deck plates. Engineers thought the plates were enough to provide a shield, and obviously they weren't. Eventually, the poop-covered walls and soaked carpets were scrubbed down or removed. $115 million went into repairing and cleaning the ship. 
and the Triumph would return to service a few months later on June 13, 2013. How much do these ships cost to make? Yeah, that's a More, good question. 115 million to repair this piece right? of shit. Like, <laughs> why not just like really? Is that worth the money? What do these cost? Like a billion dollars? <laughs> Completed oh, yeah. in 1999, Triumph cost 420 million dollars to build, which is about 620 million a day's dollars. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot of money to pour into. I guess it's still significantly cheaper than building a new boat, but damn. The Icon of the Seas, which is the world's largest cruise ship as of 2024, cost $1.86 billion. To Holy shit. A billion dollar boat, dude. Almost That's how two. much money these damn cruise lines have. And they're offering up $500 for four days of literal hell. Like, yeah. God. So I can get caught in a poop storm? You're going to, it's a $2 billion Who wants ship? to drink beer while covered in poop? Yeah, that's a good point too. Like, that's not enjoyable. No. And have well, no air conditioning? Unless you're into some weird shit. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe it I is guess. enjoyable. Maybe, maybe there's a few that enjoyed it, but God, dude. Later that year, though, newly disclosed Carnival documents show that the company was aware that only four of the six generators on board were working when they began the cruise. So there was some negligence there. Yep. And they knew about the fire hazards. The generator that caught fire was overdue for maintenance for over a year. But Carnival said the ship had passed inspections and was in quote, full compliance with all relevant regulations. The Triumph is still in operation today, yet many hmm, might want to think twice about going on it. But it's now known as the Sunrise. <laughs> <laughs> they should have called it the Cleveland Steamer. <laughs> yeah, or the Super Bowl. <laughs> That's so good. yeah, it's a sunrise after it got its $200 million refurbishment. Do you think they got every speck of poop off? <laughs> yeah. I think there's Who still knows? some poop. There's got to be a nook and cranny Fossilized somewhere. in the wall yeah. somewhere. Like, In response to the Triumph Poop Cruise, an alleged former cruise employee later posted online saying, quote, I worked on one for about five months. I would never step foot on one of these floating death trap casinos again. The food is terrible. The entertainment is lame. And there's nothing to do but drink and gamble even when it makes port, since most of the stuff in the vicinity is a tourist trap bullshit. That's exactly what I tell my wife whenever she brings up, let's go on a cruise. <laughs> She's like, oh, but a Disney cruise will be so nice. I'm like, same thing. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't trust it. I went on the Disney cruise when I was a kid. Uh, my grandparents- You see Mickey Mouse? Shelled out. I did. He was on there. He looked. He had, he had like the full Caribbean vacation thing going on. Oh, he got the the like Hawaiian shirt going. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. But uh, I mean, as a kid, obviously, I just didn't. That was it. Was awesome when I was a kid, but as an adult, I'm good. I'm good. Just there's something about being trapped on this man-made object in the middle of the ocean that just doesn't sit right with me. Yeah, it seems very unnatural. I don't like to be confined. I like to be able to leave where i'm at and go to other locations on vacation i hate being just like in one spot yeah and i what really was uh i resonated with with this guy's statement is the tourist trap bullshit i do yeah that's very it, true because they put you in the city they dock and then you just get on like the little tourist main street yeah and it's just you don't a bunch see of anything bullshit. Yeah. yeah it's just a bunch of money traps yeah yeah how about you danny you want to go on a cruise fuck no <laughs> They run some really good deals sometimes, though. I am a land mammal. Yeah, yeah. true. I was born and raised in Colorado. I, I I don't like the ocean in general. That's so true. You don't like I, the ocean that much. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stick on land where I belong. I have two legs. I don't have fins. It's where I am. That's true. But Danny, I don't have wings, but I'll still go on a plane. How do you feel about planes? Is are you guys scared of planes at all? No, no, okay. not anymore. No, I'm not. I'm not scared of planes. You used to be. Oh, yeah, when I was younger. Well, I didn't oh. go on my first plane until I was like 18. Holy shit. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That must have been a mind-blowing experience. It was mind-blowing. I thought I was like going to the fucking moon when I took <laughs> yeah. off. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. <laughs> is this okay? But. No, but I mean, I totally get that though. But planes are pretty safe. Yeah. 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 Serious. Are you going on one yeah. this week? Yeah. yeah. And Frontier, which I'm a little <laughs> iffy on. Cause it was the only flight to where I'm going. So I was like, yeah. All right. Hey, I haven't flown frontier in like 20 years, but okay, here we go. I get, there are, 
when I flew to Salt Lake City, it was like a hundred bucks on Frontier. It's so cheap. Yeah, it's cheap, but it's like right. It's a flying fucking bus. Yeah. What it is. The only, and the only thing I really hate. I mean, are we ever going to get sponsored by Frontier? No. Okay. No, I wouldn't take their money. The thing is, the thing is about Frontier, you don't get. They don't give you water. No, they charge you for literally everything. Like, come you on. You want fresh air to breathe? Yeah. Hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah. You want a little two extra inches? Hundred dollars. Yeah. You want to bring a bag? Hundred dollars. Yeah, that's where they get you is the carry on things. Yeah, you can get like the it has to be within a, a small size. Yeah, it's like a fanny pack. Yeah, is basically it. It's a rip off. It's insane, and all the other airlines are far better, and they don't charge you out the ass for a bag. That's so true. Because by the, that's what I thought at first. I was like, oh, these flights are pretty cheap. Oh, cool. Save some money on the flights. By the time I got everything I needed for my normal flight, I was like, the hell's this? Yeah. yeah this yeah. is a, just as expensive as a United flight I'd yo, take. Yo. Yeah. I'm a United person. I, I always fly United because I've had nothing but good experiences with United. Yeah. I do Delta for the same reason. And Detroit's a Delta hub. Yeah. So it's yeah. good for going home. But wait, maybe that's, maybe that's something to look into uh luxury airplanes it's like a cruise but in a plane can you imagine if there was like cruise ship level like sized planes <laughs> co2 emissions would be so high <laughs> just blanket the atmosphere yeah. just dark clouds whenever the cruise plane flew by it's like rolling coal like there's just black yeah. smoke coming out of these cruise what happens airplanes? if their toilets overflow the holy shit, crap. shit's flying Damn. down from the sky yeah poop what about the crocodiles poop apocalypse that are getting dude. smuggled on those things too Woo. yeah well there's some nightmares for you if you're listening to this while falling asleep as i know many of you do sweet dreams yeah and uh for anyone who's disappointed in me and how much laughter i get out of poop i'm sorry i'm a little bit immature sometimes. he is he yeah. is don't judge him but he's a good guy <laughs> thanks <laughs> i promise <laughs> But uh, yeah, that's going to be it for us today. Um, that was a wild one. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. If you didn't, I'm sorry. We'll do better. <laughs> but we'll see you next time. Until then, lights out, everybody. <laughs>